May I request all of you to please settle down? We will now begin with the second session of the final day of the Counterterrorism Conference. This is a session, uh, this is a panel discussion on the themes of politics of terror. May I request the chair of the session, Ms. Prabha Rao, to join us on the dais. May I now call upon Mr. Stephen Tankel to join us on the dais. Mr. Stephen Tankel is the assistant professor at the School of International Service, American University. May I now request Mr. Min Zhou to join us on the dais. Mr. Min Zhou is the executive director of the Myanmar Institute for Peace and Security. May I now request Mr. Alexander Evans to join us on the dais, please. Mr. Evans is the deputy high commissioner at the British High Commission. May I now invite Mr. Renat Abu Bakarov, an expert from the Defense Ministry in the Russian Federation, to join us on the dais, please. I will now hand over the proceedings of the session to the chair. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Minister has said most of what I want to say. But still, since I'm the chair, bear with me, I'll have to reiterate it a little more. As he said, terror and violence are now the major determinants in national and international politics. So hence, it is more than predictable that several countries are using these kind of tools instrumentalizing these kind of tools to further their own political and economic initiatives. As he said, this is absolutely visible in, in our uh, neighboring, favorite neighboring country, Pakistan, where under, uh, under the need for what they call, a highly questionable need for what they call strategic depth, their terror is unleashed in Afghanistan, and again, for various political reasons, in Kashmir. Well, the Pakistan model has been seen throughout. And as, uh, as was heard in uh, Honorable Minister's speech and in the discussions that followed, yes, uh, a lot of what is happening in the Middle East can hardly be, ha can hardly be wholly attributed to a a fight between uh, you know, the imams in, uh, uh, in the Middle Ages and the Shia and Sunni divide has got very many more in under economic underpinnings. The, the great game is continuing to be played. Uh, superpower rivalries are continuing and most of these, most of these, uh, most of these divisions are using various forms of terror, various forms of extremism to further their ends. Consequent, consequently, ladies and gentlemen, the world has now become a quantifiably more dangerous place. Radicalism and extremism, extreme recidivism, is perhaps higher today than it was 
even some even say during the time of the second world war polarization is very much more evident now what has happened and this is one point that i would uh, like to make while we can say that um, <clears throat> terror has got various political and uh, economic underpinnings the consequences of terror is something that we need to discuss when we see that countries and we can see it i mean i'm just using this as an example but the same thing can be replicated around the world when we see what has happened in pakistan now in order to use terror as a as a as an initiative you will need to radicalize the population extremism cannot go without concurrent radicalization now with concurrent radicalization the country is unleashing several eddy eddy currents which actually radicalize the population now this is something that we have seen not just in pakistan we have seen it happening in afghanistan we have seen it in places in russia we have seen it uh, across across the world definitely in the middle east today it's like what is said in um, what is said in uh, julius caesar you know it's cry havoc and let loose the dogs of war the dogs of war here being the call the forces of radicalization and it is it is there they they are there and it is now going becoming increasingly difficult to control them more so with this with the expanse of internet connectivity that is there so as i, I reiterate today we are perhaps in a more dangerous place than we have been since the second world war it's a sobering thought and this puts a lot of onus and a lot of responsibility on any kind of counter terrorism initiatives which makes the counter terrorism initiatives more urgent and more difficult given that i am glad that we have today with us a panel of practitioners and academicians we glad that they are here to give us their inputs because we as indians we have a pluralistic society we are living in a very difficult neighborhood and this this issue of the politics of terror is a matter of great significance and importance for us so without further ado i would like our panelists to come in and give us their opinions and their views and takes on this matter uh as a start i would uh, request uh, mr alexander evans the deputy high commissioner of the Brit the of the british high commission to please come and give us his views on the subject thank you well thank you very much i, I i'm going to sit sit down and speak because uh, uh, otherwise otherwise i always feel the gupshop danger of going up to a, a podium Uh, so good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and join this conference. Uh, I've been to two previous editions. It's an important event, uh, and um, the subject remains uh, ever relevant. Um, I'm going to begin uh, on a, uh, a morning uh, many years ago in 1984, in November, uh, in Mumbai, uh, when our, uh, the head of our office there, our Deputy High Commissioner in Mumbai, was uh, driving to work. Uh, and found himself assassinated uh, uh, unexpectedly, uh, because assassinations usually are unexpected, uh, by uh, an operative of the Abu Nidal organization uh, who was working across borders in India to kill a British diplomat. Uh, I, I mention this because um, uh, this year uh, marks one of the anniversaries, as it were, of that attack, uh, and uh, he is someone who is always in my mind because it's an example of a transnational terrorist attack uh, that involved a group that had received backing from others as well. But I mention it for a different reason as well, which is I think there are three themes I just want to touch on in my remarks. The first is a challenge about counting. Uh, the second is a challenge about considering. And the third is a challenge of cooperating. And I begin with counting, because I think counting and understanding the uh, number of attacks where they take place, what the trends are, both by geography and by group and by motivation, is very important for us to be able to properly respond to the threat of terrorism, not only within one geography or one country, but also regionally and globally. And one of the challenges in the 1980s was that um, the assassination of Percy Norris uh, got front page news in a range of newspapers in Europe and North America. 
But many other terrorist attacks in India did not get much mention in the Western media. And uh, I think I've spoken about this before, but the challenge was also that the preeminent or the first um, database of terrorist attacks, which was run by uh, RAND, uh, was woefully inadequate. Uh, it was a good start, but it was woefully inadequate because it tended to only count and overcount incidents that happened in Western Europe or to North Americans, rather than incidents that happened in every country in the world that happened to all types of victims. So I think, I think in the last decade, last decade and a half, we've got better at properly counting incidents where they take place, no matter who they happen to, and no matter what the group is uh, that originates the attack. But I think if we look back at the 1980s and 1990s, there was a gap in terms of the collective ability to count where attacks play, took place. The second theme is around considering. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to consider um, the actual analytics around groups and attacks. It is true that some of the time, uh, uh, terrorist groups have received support from states or from state actors. Uh, and that is, uh, that is not a problem of the past. It continues to be a problem uh, in the contemporary world as well. But it's also important to remember that terrorist groups and terrorist individuals, just like all of us, have motivations of their own. Uh, in the 1990s, I sat with uh, a range of terrorist groups while doing academic field work before I became a diplomat. Um, and uh, in those interviews, just as I, I know there are people in this room who've interviewed terrorists in a number of different circumstances, you find individuals who have their own motivations, groups that have their own motivations, and even if they take money or assistance or indeed direction from others, they may also have agendas of their own. And that, that our ability to, in a clear-headed way, analyze um, the risks and uh, roles is very important. The third theme is about cooperation. Um, it's really important on terrorism that there is cooperation globally and regionally uh, and in international institutions like the United Nations. Now, as we all know, that that has been bedeviled by the challenge that so far uh, the, the, the member states of the United Nations have been unable to agree a single definition of terrorism. And that's where the politics of terror does come in because some groups have been uh, considered terrorists by uh, uh, many uh, member states of the UN. Uh, some groups uh, still, in a sense, are given an exception clause by member states of the UN. Um, and that, that is why the United Nations General Assembly has never been able to reach consensus on a definition of terrorism. And that remains, I would argue, a challenge in today's world. That having been said, the Security Council has managed, for all the, the faults that people find sometimes with the Security Council, the Security Council as a group of 15 states has been able to uh, come up with a specific identification and indeed a sanctions regime around the Al-Qaeda, Daesh and Taliban sanctions regime. And even when there has not been unity among members of the Security Council on many issues, there has generally been unity on this uh, sanctions regime and the naming and identification of both groups and individuals associated with Al-Qaeda, Daesh and the Taliban. My final point really then is about the importance of analysis devoid of politics. We cannot take away politics from terrorism. The motivation of terrorists and terrorist groups is fundamentally a political motivation as well as a terrorist motivation. <coughs> the way in which governments respond is always going to be laced somewhat by politics. If nothing else, because we treat terrorism very seriously, not necessarily solely because of the death and destruction that it can cause, but because of the fear, the political effect that terrorism can have within our countries and across borders. But it is incredibly important for governments, for think tanks, for serious think tanks, for serious academics, to make sure that we can come up with analysis that is devoid of politics. Uh, and that analysis has to be configured on two essential ingredients. The first essential ingredient is knowing that we don't know everything. There will always be gaps. If anybody says that they know everything there is to know about a group, uh, everything there is to know about a terrorist network, uh, they are um, displaying significant overconfidence, and I would argue displaying a fundamental lack of judgment. The most interesting analysts of terrorism are those who acknowledge that they don't have the full picture, 
and they will never know enough to be fully informed about a subject. The second thing is, is uh, so the first I would argue is understanding gaps. The second ingredient is recognizing that we cannot predict the future and that surprise will continue to be a feature of, our, uh, of the way in which terrorist groups operate, both in terms of technology, in terms of networks, and in terms of modalities uh, of attacks. That doesn't mean that everything will be unfamiliar, but it does mean that our ability to peer into the future and anticipate where attacks will take place is not always accurate. Uh, there was some discussion earlier about could one, uh, could one foresee what happens in certain areas if you're looking out from the 1980s to the 1990s and 2000s. I could not have foreseen uh, in the 1990s that the scale of uh, Islamist associated terrorism would be such as with the, what we have seen uh, after 9-11. Um, and I would not have anticipated the uh, overwhelming volume of foreign terrorist fighters from so many countries, from over 100 countries, that flooded into Syria and Iraq when Daesh was, a, was, at, was at its peak. So I think, you know, if I, if I close on a question, I think one of the questions that we have in future, we know that Al-Qaeda and Daesh and other groups have sought to capitalize on the issues between Myanmar and Bangladesh over um, the Rohingya uh, refugees. We know that that was uh, tried before by Al-Qaeda unsuccessfully to try and mobilize uh, radicalization and mobilize terrorist mobilization. One of the exam questions I think we need to consider for the future is can we, can we, be, can we be certain about what trend we will see in one year's, two years time or five years time? I would argue we can never be certain. But what we can be is more confident if we uh, anchor around analytics that are evidence-based informed by our understanding of gaps and shaped by a recognition that we can and will sometimes be surprised. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Evans. So ladies and gentlemen, I would say that one of the main takeaways and a very important takeaway from this talk is that the terrorists seem to be cooperating a great deal more than the community of nations, which is something that we have been seeing for some time, which of course is a matter of serious worry because like he said, the unpredictability and the magnitude of attacks which are coming up, given that, and the kind of cooperation there is between terrorists, it is, I think, now a matter of urgent necessity that there is greater comity in the community of nations. Thank you. And with that, I'd request uh, Mr. Stephen Tankle to please give us his comments. I'm an academic, so I, I love a podium, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and use this here. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the, the India Foundation for having me out here. It's uh, my second time uh, attending this conference, um, and it does not disappoint. It's, in a, it's a very important event. Uh, and it's a great gathering of experts, so I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity to, to contribute. Uh, I'm also thrilled to be on a panel about the politics of terror because I, I think it's about time we put the politics back into political violence uh, and acknowledge their place. Uh, we should do it uh, objectively in terms of our analysis, but we should be very mindful of the fact that it's impossible to study terrorism or counterterrorism without accounting for uh, political machinations that exist. And so I want to talk today about the politics of uh, jihadist groups, uh, which are the groups that have been talked about a lot over the last couple of days, and about the politics of state actions towards those groups, both supporting or enabling them uh, and also trying to counter them, sometimes uh, in the cases of some countries, both, uh, and then close by discussing how I see these connect with one another. Uh, We've heard throughout the last couple of days, uh, and it's absolutely correct, that jihadists are religiously motivated uh, terrorists. Uh, one should not discount the importance of religious conviction, religious motivation. Uh, one should not discount the importance of theology. But that doesn't mean that they don't have political objectives. And while there's no such thing as a good terrorist versus a bad terrorist, it is also the case that terrorists, and especially jihadists, are not one size fits all. 
So it is important to draw distinctions between them in terms of what they are trying to achieve, in terms of their objectives. Now their ultimate goal for most jihadist organizations is the restoration of the caliphate and uh, their, you know, the, the application of their interpretation of Sharia, Islamic law, here on earth. But that's a very, very long-term objective. And from an analytical perspective, it doesn't really help us to get at uh, the variegation that exists within the jihadist movement. And they are quite different in terms of their near and medium-term objectives. Um, so I think it's helpful to look at the political content of their ideology. I'm an academic, we love to categorize things. So I'll provide a couple of different categories um, that I, and, I and, and other academics have identified within the wider jihadist movement. The first is revolutionary. Uh, these are jihadists who, in terms of the political content of their objectives, seek to overthrow what they believe are apostate Muslim regimes. Second would be pan-Islamic jihadists. Uh, these are those who, in terms of their political orientation, are more externally oriented. Think about lashkar e taiba which perceives itself to be liberating uh, lands that were, in their interpretation, under Muslim control and defending the Ummah. Whether or not one agrees with them, that's what they perceive themselves as doing. There are global jihadists, Al-Qaeda being the most famous, uh, that focus historically on the United States and its Western allies. There are those who think that the most important thing that they can do, the most important target they can attack, are Shiites or other sects that are not Salafi jihadists, uh, or in the case of Pakistan, uh, those that are not Diabandi. Now, of course, over the last five to 10 years, we've seen a hybridization so that a lot of groups have multiple political objectives. They may be revolutionary and global. They may be pan-Islamic and global. They may be revolutionary and sectarian. One could argue that ISIS incorporated all of these. But it's never less important to account for the fact that these groups have different motivations. And that's particularly important when we look at how states respond to them. We, all we need to do is look at this neighborhood to know that states don't treat all jihadist groups the same. When we talk about terrorist cooperation, I'm sorry, when we talk about counterterrorism cooperation, we tend to talk a lot about shared threats. As a matter of fact, if you look at the United States uh, strategies to, for counterterrorism, the concept of working with partners against shared threats comes up a lot. But there's a problem with that, in, in that it's not always enough to share a threat. And I would submit to you that one of the most critical aspects of this is how a state ranks uh, a terrorist threat relative to other threats it faces. And I'll offer you a few examples. Is ISIS and Al-Qaeda a threat for Turkey? Sure, it is. Both groups are, but not to the same degree as the Kurds. Are ISIS and Al-Qaeda threats for the Saudis? 100%, but I'd submit that they worry more about Iran in the big picture. And of course, Pakistan has gone after some jihadist groups while supporting others, but it sees all jihadist groups, even the ones that challenge it, as posing a lower threat than, of course, India does uh, to Pakistan. For a certain amount of time, they can help secure different types of cooperation, perhaps access, but they won't change fundamental calculus. They're rarely enough to move the way a state views a terrorist group. And so at the end of the day, as with all politics, what we're left with in terms of cooperation is the art of the possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thankel. It's very good to get an academic's view on the subject. Now I would uh, uh, please request Mr. Min Zhao to give us his opinion. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to many of since in independence from the British, the armed conflict has been ongoing for 70 years. So Myanmar is characterized 
as the longest running civil war. Uh, however, uh, nowadays, if you go to Myanmar, almost all populated areas in Myanmar are absent of armed conflict. So how the government managed to do that, even though that was a military hunter in the last uh, 25, 30 years? In late 1980s, there were about 60 plus armed groups fighting the government in different capacities. Most of the fighting occurred outside populated areas. The insurgent groups are based along the border of Thailand, China, India, and Bangladesh. Since 1989, the military government changed its approach in counterinsurgency campaign. The government saw ceasefire, the military honda saw ceasefire with ethnic armed groups. The government allowed the armed groups to keep their weapons and the troops and to accumulate wealth by engaging in formal and informal economies. So government strategy was to turn the militant leaders into economic tycoons. And a lot of them become really uh, economic tycoons. So as a result, there were 40 armed groups that sought the deal with the military government. And most of the fighting stopped uh, with these groups. By 2009, the government put pressure on the, these groups either to be disarmed or transformed to paramilitary forces under the government control. So by 2009, to among these 40 groups that saw ceasefire with the government, 15 groups were totally disarmed. 15 were transformed. The government is facing about 30 armed groups. Uh, the, during the course of transition to democracy in the last seven years, there were about six new armed groups in March or Rearm. However, the military government ceasefire and wealth approaches not a failure. There is a limited success. About 40% of armed groups were disarmed, including a few large ones, and about 50% were transformed into militia or paramilitary forces under the control of the military. The transition government in 2011 pursue a new strategy, offering ceasefire and political dialogue, but economic opportunities. So the government also came to bilateral ce agreements, ceasefire agreements with the 40 armed groups. Among them, eight groups signed the nationwide ceasefire agreements in 2015. Now that outlined a roadmap to the overall peace process. Even though the armed clashes are still going on with five groups that did not have ceasefire agreements with the government, the clashes between the government and eight signatories that signed the nationwide ceasefire agreements reduced about 90%. So although the Myanmar peace process does not progress to the expectation of the international community, the conflict dynamic was reduced and stability was restored in most parts of the country. Currently, there were only about five groups actively fighting the government, including those uh, Rohingya militants in Rakhine State. These groups used different array of violent methods, including IED attacks targeting civilians. In 2017, there were about 159 mines and IED attacks, and 35 civilians were killed, and 97 are wounded. In 2018, up to the end of February, there were 20 IED attacks uh, and also uh, that killed four civilians and wounded 41. Most of the attacks actually occur in conflict zones, um, not in the major cities or the populated area. But in some cases, IED attacks target civilians and non-military installation without discrimination. Since 2018, uh, we are seeing the rise of IED explosions uh, targeting civilians and non-military uh, installations. Uh, 
Uh, although both uh, Islamic State and Al-Qaeda in Indian subcontinent declare Myanmar as a target, we have not seen any high-profile attack or current ongoing attacks orchestrated by these international uh, terrorist organizations in Myanmar. In fact, none of the groups claim responsibility of IED attacks in Myanmar since early 90s. Actually, there, no groups in Myanmar ever claim any explosion uh, targeting civilians. Unlike the Islamic groups in Myanmar, Myanmar-based armed groups do not claim credit on those uh, IED attacks, especially in populated area. Um, Mr. Wu, if you don't mind, we'd have to Great. wind up. Yeah, let me wrap up by, by saying that uh, it, by looking at some of the strategies used in Myanmar, uh, it was an imperfect solution. It was not the perfect solution, imperfect solution, but to some extent, uh, it worked. So when considering uh, counter-terrorism and also counter-insurgency, uh, we have to ask ourselves how much extent we would like to accept an uh, imperfect solution uh, to this solution, uh, to this problem. Thank you. So thank you very much for your valuable inputs on integrating uh, various tribes within a plural country. I now uh, request our final speaker, Mr. Uh, Renat Abubakarov, to please give us his views. Добрый день, уважаемые дамы и господа. Меня зовут Ренат Абакиров. Я являюсь экспертом Министерства обороны Российской Федерации. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Renat Abubakirov, expert of the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation. Мне поручено поделиться с вами опытом практического участия вооруженных сил России в борьбе с терроризмом в Сирийской Арабской Республике. I'm entrusted to share the experience of the practical engagement of the Russian armed forces in the fight against terrorism in the Syrian Arab Republic. Начало нашей военной операции положение в этой стране было критическим. Uh, by the beginning of our military operation in Syria, the situation in this country was critical. Правительство Сирии в одиночку вело боевые действия против терроризма на своей территории, а отряды так называемой умеренной оппозиции фактически слились в Сигил и Джабхата Нусры, которые имели свое более щедрое финансирование со своих зарубежных спонсоров. Uh, the Syrian government was combating terrorism on its territory alone, while the so-called moderate opposition units actually merged with ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, which enjoyed more generous funding from their foreign sponsors. Террористы контролировали более 70 процентов территории страны и продолжали наступать на всех направлениях. Terrorists controlled more than 70 percent of the country's territory and continued to advance in all directions. Недавно процветающая страна превратилась в источник распространения террористической опасности для всего Ближнего Востока. Сирия, which we used to know before as a prosperous country, has become a source of spread of terrorist danger for the entire Middle East. В сложившихся условиях военно-политическим руководством страны в ответ на официальное обращение Дамаска было принято решение на применение вооруженных сил России в антитеррористической операции на территории Сирийской Арабской Республики. Under such circumstances, the military and political establishment of Russia, acting in response to the official request from Damascus, decided to deploy the Russian armed forces to participate in the anti-terrorist operation on the territory of the Syrian Arab Republic. Подчеркиваю, что наши подразделения с первых минут своего пребывания в Сирии находятся там на законных основаниях по просьбе правительства суверенного государства, чего не скажешь о международной коалиции, которая до юра нарушает все каноны международного права. Uh, let me emphasize that our military units from the very beginning of their operation in Syria are staying there legally at the request of the government of a sovereign state, which cannot be said about the international coalition that the Jure violates all norms of international law. С 30 сентября 2015 года Воздушно-космические силы России приступили к нанесению ударов по террористам. Uh, since the 30th of September 2015, the Russian airspace forces have begun conducting airstrikes against terrorists. 
В результате ударов разрушена система управления и тыловая инфраструктура. As a result, the control system and logistical infrastructure have been destroyed. Прекращено ресурсное обеспечение ИГИЛ. Террористы решились основного источника поступления финансовых средств от нелегальной продажи нефтепродуктов. Ресурсные средства для ИСИС были остановлены. Террористы потеряли основной источник их финансовых средств, базированный на нелегальном продаже нефтепродуктов. Перекрыты маршруты снабжения боевиков оружием и боеприпасами. Необходимо отметить, что все удары наносились и наносятся по целям, которые подтверждены данными разведисточников, в том числе средств космической разведки и беспилотных летательных аппаратов. It is necessary to know that all the targets are confirmed by the intelligence sources, including means of space surveillance and unmanned aerial vehicles. При этом применение авиации по объектам культурного наследия, мечетям, школам и госпиталям, даже при нахождении там террористов, полностью исключается. The use of aviation against cultural heritage sites, mosques, schools and hospitals, even in case of presence of terrorists there, is totally excluded. К началу операции в Сирии на авиабазе Ихмимим в кратчайшие сроки была создана авиационная группировка, состоящая только из современных и модернизированных образцов авиатехники оборудованных все самыми передовыми прицельными навигационными комплексами. By the beginning of the operation in Syria, an air group fully comprised of modern and modernized aircraft, equipped with the most advanced sighting and navigation systems, was deployed at the Khmimim Air Base in the shortest time. Это дало возможность наносить высокоточные удары по банк формирования на всей территории Сирии. This enabled us to conduct high-precision strikes against insurgent groups throughout Syria. Широкое использование разведывательных ударных систем на основе комплексов разведки, управления и связи позволило реализовать принцип "одна цель, одна бомба". The wide use of reconnaissance and strike systems based on surveillance, control, and communication complexes allowed us to follow the principle "one target, one bomb." Всего с начала военной операции авиация ВКС совершила более 37 тысяч боевых вылетов. Since the beginning of the operation, Russian air forces have conducted more than 37,000 sorties. Впервые в истории таких операций к уничтожению террористов привлечены самолеты дальней стратегической авиации. Это сверхзвуковые бомбардировщики Ту-160, бомбардировщики ракетоносцы Ту-95 и тяжелые бомбардировщики Ту-22. For the first time in the history of such operations, long-range strategic aircraft, for example, Tupolev Tu-160 supersonic bombers, Tu-95 bombers and missile carriers, Tu-22M heavy bombers, were involved in liquidation of terrorists. Из акватории Каспийского и Средиземного морей проследены пуски крылатых ракет морского базирования военно-морского флота России. The Russian Navy has launched sea-based cruise missiles from the Caspian and Mediterranean seas. За время участия воздушно-космических сил в боевых действиях правительству войска Министерства удалось в корне переломить ситуацию в свою пользу, разгромить боевиков и 6 декабря 2017 года полностью освободить от ИГИЛ территорию страны. During the participation of the Russian air space forces in the operation, the Syrian government troops managed to radically change the situation in their favor, resulting in the defeat of militants and complete liberation of the country from ISIS on the 6th of December 2017. В условиях жесткого информационного давления, а фактически информационной войны, развязанной отдельными государствами в ходе дискредитации действий России в Сирии, Министерство обороны пошло на беспрецедентные шаги по освещению и переданию максимальной открытости хода ведения боевых действий. Under the tough information pressure, which was actually an information war unleashed by individual states with the aim to discredit Russia's actions in Syria. The Ministry of Defense took unprecedented steps to cover and ensure maximum publicity of the operation. Опыт борьбы с терроризмом показал, что одними военными мерами сирийский кризис не решить. The experience of the fight against terrorism demonstrated that the Syrian crisis cannot be solved only by military means. Одновременно с выполнением боевых задач российские военнослужащие проводят работу с вооруженными отрядами, готовыми прекратить боевые действия и вернуться к мирной жизни а также оказывают гуманитарную помощь на освобожденных территориях. At the same time with conducting uh, combat missions, the Russian officers work with insurgent groups 
which are ready to cease hostilities and return to peaceful life, as well as provide humanitarian assistance on the liberated territories. С этой целью на аэродроме Хмимим с начала операции действует центр по применению по примирению враждующих сторон в Сирии. With this purpose, the Center for Reconciliation of Opposing Sides in Syria operates in the Hmaimim Air Base from the beginning of the operation. Работа центра сосредоточена на содействии прекращения огня путем диалога сирийских государственных структур и конструктивной позиции по примирению враждующих сторон. The center is focused on facilitating the ceasefire process through supporting the dialogue on reconciliation between the Syrian government and constructive opposition. Осуществляется сбор информации о нарушениях режима примирения. As well as collecting the information on violations of the ceasefire regime. Создана зона деэскалации и деконфликтации на границах сторон и сослужб подразделения военной полиции вооруженных сил России. Деэскалация и деконфликтация зон are established, and the military police units of the Russian armed forces deployed on their borders. Мирные жители видят в них основного гаранта соблюдения режима прекращения огня и войны в целом. Russian servicemen are perceived by the local population as the main guarantors of the ceasefire and end of war in general. На освобожденных от террористов территориях ведется гуманитарное разминирование специалистами международного противоминного центра вооруженных сил России. Humanitarian demining is ensured on the liberated territories by the specialists of the International Mine Action Center of the Russian Armed Forces. Всего с начала операции в Сирии российскими саперами разминировано более 6,5 тысяч гектаров территории, более 17 тысяч зданий и 1,400 километров автомобильных дорог. In total, since the beginning of the operation in Syria, Russian sappers have cleared more than 6,500 hectares of the territory, more than 17,000 buildings and 1,400 kilometers of roads. При этом обезвредили свыше 105 тысяч взрывоопасных предметов, а также обучили свыше тысячи сирийских военнослужащих, что позволяет сирийской армии самостоятельно обезвреживать от снарядов мин и бомб освобожденные территории. More than 105,000 explosive devices were neutralized, and over 1,000 Syrian military personnel were trained, which enables the Syrian army to independently clear the liberated territories from projectiles, mines, and bombs. В заключение хочу отметить, что в своих действиях на сирийском направлении мы исходим из того, что судьбу Сирии, ее политическое устройство и кого выбирают высшие органы власти, будут решать только сам сирийский народ. In conclusion, I would like to note that in our involvement in the Syrian issue, we proceed from the understanding that only the Syrian people should decide the destiny of their country, including its political system and who is to be elected to the senior government posts. А Сирия должна сохраниться как единое сирийское государство, которым оно было до конца 2011 года. At the same time, Syria should remain as a united secular state, as it had been before 2011. Вот, собственно говоря, вся небольшая информация о действиях российских вооруженных сил по борьбе с терроризмом в Сирии, которая мне поручено было с вами поделиться. Благодарю за внимание. So this is briefly speaking a complete picture of the activities of the Russian armed forces aimed at combating terrorism in Syria. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Abbebakar, for a very, very good presentation on Syria. Now to open the house for questions. But I'd like to start off with one. Uh, I'd like uh, your opinion, Mr. Abu Bakarov, on uh, what you feel would be the, the way the Kurdish problem is going to resolve and what would be um, the Russian government attitude towards the various Kurd factions. Thank you. Mr. Abubakir, Abubakir uh, preferred to abstain from answering this question because 
this uh, doesn't uh, correspond with the uh, theme of uh, the session. My name is Ashwat Komath and I'm from the South Asian University. Uh, my question is aimed at uh, the Deputy High Commissioner from the British High Commission. So you did mention something about evidence-based uh, policy making and research. So can you just currently tell us about what the gaps are in, the, uh, uh, in uh, this particular field and what exactly are we talking about? What kind of evidence are we talking about? What needs to be improved in the academic sector in order to improve this research for policy making? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I, I would pick out two particular things. It's not to say that we don't know a lot about terrorist groups. We do. In fact, there's more and more material available, uh, partly uh, thanks to the use of the internet by terrorist groups to post up lots of material themselves. Um, but I would argue that there are two key um, gaps. One is a generic gap, and the other is a thematic gap. The generic gap is we often don't know enough day to day, week to week, about what the precise plans or motivations may be of a particular group or particular network. So when we do know, that's great news. We can disrupt, uh, we can detain, we can take uh, 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 legally based action uh, to uh, prevent uh, terrorist attacks from happening. Um, but let me give an example in terms of, let's take uh, a group that may be operating in uh, Libya today we don't necessarily know right now what that group of people is considering, even if we've identified some of the people in that group, and even if we understand what ideology drives that group in terms of its motivations. So I think it's important to be aware that gap, there are always gaps. Um, and, and a little bit, uh, dare I say it, like ourselves, uh, we don't necessarily understand our own motivations on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't necessarily know today what you will want to do next Friday. Uh, even if you have a strategy in terms of how you approach things. The second gap, I think, is more profound, which is our, our understanding of radicalization. So an enormous amount of money has been spent to try and understand the pathway uh, of individual radicalization uh, in terrorist groups. There's a similar uh, academic uh, research around membership of um, cults, extreme cults. Um, it's a little bit like the story of falling in love. We all have stories about how we fell in love, and we tell those stories rather like our own autobiographies again and again to other people. But the story we tell may not necessarily reflect the exact pathway, the exact story that we lived ourselves. So the challenge we have around radicalization is almost all the explanations for radicalization. Why is it that India has so many fewer uh, radicalized terrorists than uh, other countries? Now, I think there are reasonable explanations for that. Uh, I think some of those explanations lie in the, the nature of tolerant Indian society and Indian democracy. Um, but why, why does India have far, more fewer, far fewer terrorists than, say, the Maldives, or even on a per capita basis, uh, looking, at, uh, looking at a country like Finland? Um, and so radicalization, I would argue, is the biggest thematic gap in our understanding. Despite lots and lots of research, lots of work by governments, by intelligence agencies, by academics, we still don't have a full enough picture of how radicalization takes place, and more importantly, what governments and international organizations can do to arrest radicalization early on. Thank you. Can I just wanted to, I have a question for uh, Mr. Renat Abu Bakero. I think uh, while everybody agrees that a secular and sovereign Syrian Republic is an interest of the international community. And I think everybody wants that the external interference should reduce. But what I find intriguing is that blatant Turkish infringement of Syrian sovereignty has not been criticized unequivocally by the Russian Federation. The Russian opposition to Turkish incursions have not been as vehement and as vociferous as one would have expected 
since you say that you are committed to Syrian sovereignty and integrity? Russian expert. Uh, this statement has appeared in a very reputed journal. Syria has repeatedly violated international law by using chemical weapons on its own population. Do you agree with this statement or not? In case you agree, how do you support a regime which uses chemical weapons against its own population? Thank you. Any more questions? On. Okay. Uh, this is Juya from Iran. Uh, first of all, I have to thank uh, India Foundation for uh, convening such a magnificent conference. And also I have to uh, um, uh, thank all the uh, distinguished uh, guests for their contributions. Of course, uh, I 100% um, inside a car, really, to drive it or to stop it driving. So the political need, uh, will is needed to stop ISIL. And about ISIL and Nusra, for example, we know enough to combine our efforts. These organizations are on sanctions lists, not uh, just in the UN, but in a lot of countries, including Russia. We know enough about the leaders of terrorist international to work effectively against the leaders. Don't you think that we know enough? My question is uh, to our colleague who, who, who spoke first. But thank you for your time. But we take it with two other questions coming up. Yes, please. Yes, please. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, my name is Mithun. I'm a student of uh, international relations at South Asian University in New Delhi. Uh, my question is to Mr. Minzau. Um, pertaining to the question of the security, uh, the questions of security related to the issue of the Rohingya, uh, there are reports that uh, the philanthropic wing of the Lashkar e Taiba, Palai Insaniyat, has reached out in terms of sending relief and in terms of assistance of monetary uh, assistance to uh, the f a few of the Rohingya in, in the, uh, the Rakhine province and even in some parts of Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. Uh, so, how big do you see this as a threat to uh, the, 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 sp the, the involvement of transnationalist jihadi, jihadi ent the entities into the coming of the conflict uh, in Myanmar and what can be the counter strategies to uh, sort of contain it given that the crux of the problem may not exactly li be limited to the inside of the territory, it might even go into the neighboring countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, when it came to the international jihadis uh, coming into Myanmar or operating in Myanmar, at this point it's still slim. Because in Myanmar, most of the Muslim population inside the country uh, moderate. Uh, there is in Myanmar. However, uh, it, uh, but what we are seeing is that kind of technology transfer and assistance are not just only limited to those Rohingya groups. There were bombings in 2013 October. Uh, the triggering device used in that bombings are very similar to those used in Pakistan and Afghanistan. But what is more interesting is those bombings were orchestrated not by any Islamic groups, but by an ethnic groups in Myanmar who turn out to be a Christian. The question is how they get the kind of device. This is not something you can fabricate from YouTube uh, or from the internet. So we are beginning to see some sort of technology transfer, not just only limited to Islamic related or relevant groups, but also to non-Islamic uh, ethnic armed groups in Myanmar as well.
Well, thank you. Thank you. I've, I've been asked to um, say, do we sometimes know enough, as it were? Uh, I think sometimes we do know enough, and I give two examples on this. I think the first is the uh, treatment of civilians uh, in Syria, and I think we all know enough about the treatment of Syrians in Syria, uh, and we've all had a lot of access to material that I don't think is disinformation. It, it's analysis from a range of different sources and very well evidenced. Uh, and given the challenge from my uh, Russian Federation colleague, I would also mention that this week we know enough about the first uh, use of a military-grade uh, agent, as it were, in, uh, in an attempt to kill British citizens uh, in the UK. And there again, we also know enough. Um, but I think there's, there's a fundamental point here about knowledge, which is it's always useful to know more. And I would argue two reasons for that. Uh, and I think these are reasons that uh, would be recognizable both in the UK and in India. And those reasons are essentially as follows, which is it's always useful to know more in, in order to understand uh, why an incident happened and what more could be done by governments to prevent incidents. And the other thing is, in democracies, one of the great advantages about a democracy with rule of law is we seek to prosecute uh, criminals and terrorists after the event. And on that basis, it's useful to have enough evidence to properly prosecute people in a, in a court of law afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a, a, a few points. Uh, first, to really just echo this idea that information is somehow not valuable, that we can know enough, that we shouldn't ever want to know more. You can't solve a problem if you don't understand a problem. Um, you can try to crush a problem by any means necessary, um, but to truly solve a problem requires information. And on the subject of information, you know, as somebody who studies terrorism for a living, one of the, the, the things I teach my students is that we've struggled for a long time to define terrorism. And because for a long time we struggled to define terrorism, we instead focused on terrorist acts because they were at least observable. And I think it is highly dangerous and highly disingenuous when we begin to question what is factual information that has been provided by multiple objective sources, such as the use of chemical weapons in Syria or assassinations in the UK. Intervention because we're running out of time. So um. I, I, I hate to, to. I'm sorry, the audience, but I have have to respond. You contradict yourself. You are saying that you know enough. You should know enough about this or that, and then suddenly you quote a case where a couple of days after the event with this nerve gas, Novichok or whatever in uh, Salisbury, you're already jumping to the most dramatic conclusion that Russia is to blame. What information do you have? No information was presented by the UK side to the Russian side through the International Organization on Chemical Weapons or directly. No information was presented and you suddenly jump to a conclusion that Russia is involved in, in an absolutely stupid terrorist action in the center of the UK. I would like to say, not to try to, 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 to say whether it's logic or not, I'm saying just this. Russia is not doing this. It's our principled position, historical and modern, and that's my main argument. And another thing about factual information about the use of chemical weapons in Syria, etc. What sources are you quoting? White Helmets? The NGOs, which is now famous for its ties with terrorist organizations, first of all, with Nusra. It was caught many times because it produced faked videos on, on children killed in Aleppo. Now it's about Ghouta. They're absolutely 
fake, with children sitting there perfectly healthy and with the tomato ketchup on their clothes. Those are the sources you create this information picture. Shame on you. You are quoting no, cases for excuse which... Excuse me, we can't use this forum for, uh, for settling these kind of grievances, but we've had a very I'm interesting uh, discussion. So um, we, could, Sorry, we, could, I... we could continue okay. the discussion over tea. So, um... I thought this forum is exactly for this discussion. Tea, I could drink it in Moscow. Thank you. <laughs> okay, coffee then. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, speakers, for a very engaging discussion. Uh, may I now request the chair to felicitate our speakers? Mr. Stephen Tankle. <laughs> Mr. Min Zou. Dr. Alexander Evans. <laughs> Dr. Alexander Evans. Uh, may I now request Major General Dhruv Katoch to felicitate the chair. Thank you. May I request all of you to please remain seated. We'll immediately start the next session on future of terrorism and terrorism of future.